But the hardest part I found about playing chess is learning how to get better in the middle game. So what I did is I bought this book, which is Improve Your Chess Pattern Recognition, which helps you identify middle game concepts and motifs to help you better improve that middle game. So the first chapter that we're gonna be going over today is the octopus, which is a very powerful knight on the opponent's side of the board. And let's just jump into it. So on our very first chess game that we're gonna be going over that features this strong octopus knight is between very, two very strong players, Parant Melkumyan versus Evigeny Posny. So in this, they were gonna, they're playing the queen's gambit and they're obviously high level player. So what happens here is they're just kind of playing the opening. It's a Queen's Gambit accepted and they're playing the, the moves to theory as close to it as possible. You can see the eval bar here on the left isn't really moving an inch at all. And so they're playing basically perfectly and playing in a drawish position. So the biggest problem is when we get here, Bishop comes over here to G5. So in this position, it's a great move for white because what you're trying to do is you're trying to trade off these dark squared bishops and getting this knight over here on d6, supported by this pawn outpost here. Now getting this knight over here to d6 or black getting its knight over here to d3, this is called the octopus. And the reason why the octopus is so powerful because when you do have this knight over here on d6, you're controlling all these important squares on the enemy side of the board. So you're completely restricting the enemy's movement and it's become a really big thorn in the opponent's side, and it becomes by far your strongest piece. So from here, black castles, and white throws that knight right onto d6 here. You cannot take back because you lose the queen, and white develops over here to b8, trying to protect this bishop from being taken by the knight. Now in this position, probably wondering why don't you just take, because you have two pieces here, and the reason being, after bishop takes g5 here, knight takes b d b7 here, threatening the queen, the queen moves, the bishop takes over here on d5. After taking the bishop back, the queen comes here and you can't take back because I'll take here and we can just get this, this knight outpost back at this point and black is down upon. So that is not the best move for black in that position. And they went with protecting the bishop here instead. So from here, what white does is they take over here on d5, black takes back with the pawn and then they trade off the bishops, removing one of the strongest pieces on unseating this octopus knight. After the knight takes here on e7, the queen centralizes and the queen gets over here off the square on d8, going to d7. Knight comes over here to g5, looking to threaten checkmate here and black blocks it with his knight to g6. And then white pushes e4, which is a, a mistake, basically. Uh, the better thing to do is to fortify the outpost on d6 with queen to g3. So what she should have done instead, instead of knight to g6, going queen to d3 here, protecting this so if the knight takes back you can just take back here and then after f6 ruining that you just push the pawn forward the queen is still protecting the knight over here on d3 you're threatening the queen here it's protected by this and then you're looking to push the pawn up here uh, things are looking really good for you but instead after pushing up to f4 black pushes up to f6 and white takes the knight over here giving up its super powerful light squared bishop and what happens is you can see the eval bar has now turned into black's favor it is now about 0.56, half a point in black's favor. Instead, what white should have done is instead of going knight to take the uh, b7 bishop here, he should have taken h7 here, because after the king takes back, rook comes f3, it's looking to barrel down here. So what the rook does is it comes over to h8, and you're getting the other rooks in the game, and just attacking that, that king side as quick as possible. White has that a point and a half advantage, and it's easily winning, especially at this level. Now, because they traded off their strongest piece, you can see white's position slowly crumbles and um, it, it's not looking good. <laughs> uh, black is now up a piece and easily losing the game here. So that is the end of the first game and hopefully it shows the highlight of how strong that knight can be and what can happen if you just disregard your strongest piece. So in our second game here, we're playing between two masters, Johnny Hector and Jens Ulf Fries Nilsson. Uh, and this is another great example of trading off that dark squared bishop to get yourself that strong knight. So from here, white goes e4, black goes into the Scandinavian defense, and we go into the Mises Kotrick variation. This is the one that I normally play. It's very solid. You just get your king to safety and develop, attack that queen, all the fun stuff. So white is developing its pieces, trying to get as many pieces to the center as possible. What we can see here is for white, the money square is here on d6. So getting this knight over here and here. Uh, after bishop takes d2, rook takes back, knight goes to h5 here, looking to attack this bishop. 
Bishop comes back. Black wants to make room for its queen here over here on c6 to really double up on this e5 square. But what it does is it weakens this square here for black. So after getting this knight back, bishop comes back and white goes to trade it off with bishop to b4. After black accepts the exchange, the knight comes back here to trade off the knights. And then white says, nah, I don't need to. I'm going to come over here to d6, threaten this queen. And I'm really restricting all these pieces for black, right? You're also threatening here on b7. Things are looking good for, for white. So after the queen comes to c7, rook comes over here to d1, a5 trying to push the queen away, queen just retreats back to a3, knight comes over here to b6, and rook comes over here to d3. So after going rook to d3, black comes over here to push the knight, octopus knight away, and white just fortifies that instead. So black pushes over here to d5, white comes over here, rook to b7 looking to take this pawn, rook to a7 to defend it, Rook to g3, getting some attackers on the king side. Knight from c to e7, just trying to improve their pieces as much as possible. So white continues to attack the queen, going queen to f3. Knight comes over here to g6. And h4 is played, which is a great move. The reason being, after rook comes over to a8, you attack the knight over here on g6. The knights are traded. Rook takes back queen to e7. And the rooks are lining up on this file. You can't push here because the pawn will take back and that's exactly what happens. And now that the rook is staring at the queen, you just take here on g6. And after taking back, you throw another a check. And from here, you have checkmate. And it's all because the knight over here on d6 was very strong in restricting the movement of his pieces on his side of the board. I mean, this is the reason, the reason it's called the Octopus Knights because all its tentacles are everywhere around your opponent's pieces. So in our next game against the two masters, Nefisa Muminova versus Fan Big Knock. So what we're going to see here is white's going to push up c4 to c5 attacking this bishop but more importantly is it's going to weaken this d5 square and give black a very strong outpost here for themselves however what it's doing is over here on d6 we're going to have a very strong knight outpost so what we see here is we go c5 and then bishop takes e5 trading off that dark squared bishop and what we do as white is we take the Take with the pawn and after white goes over here to e4 to e6 it's a very strong knight so after white gets its desired outpost over here on d5 white just develops that knight to e4 the rook comes over here to f8 we bring the bishop over here to protect both of these pawns in case black wants to go for either of them and after the queen centralizes looking to attack here after two attackers we just thrust the knight over here to d6 setting this octopus and giving black less space white it has the clear advantage at a point and a half and white went on to win this game so that is a, a good example of how to create the plans in your head in the middle game of what's the best way to improve my pieces and really limit black's activity as well especially when you have an octopus knight so in our fourth game here we're looking at a game between angelica stoyanovich versus dusan kolovich we're going to start off with an english opening here and so they play their opening Buying for central control of the board. All the fun stuff that starts with the opening until we get to the middle game. And after this knight gets over here on d3, which is an, an octopus knight for black himself. It's supported by this f3 knight. Queen comes over here to e3, looking to trade off. And the bishop comes here, attacking the queen instead. So what white does is it takes, rook takes here. And now black has this octopus knight in the queenless middle game. And this example shows why an octopus knight might not be the best knight in an end game where you're not don't have the peace restriction that you're used to having like we've had in the other examples so after rook comes over here and takes on on e8 knight comes over here to a4 you attack over here on g1 it's taken by the rook and black gives off his strong octopus knight king takes over here on f2 you throw the check there and bishop comes over here to g4 there's a little bit too much calculation. What he should have done instead is instead of going g4, he should have gone knight to g5 attacking this knight. The reason being, after the trade, you get the rooks in the game. And it's material imbalance, but it leads to a lot more of an equal position. The, the engine has it at exactly zeros. But instead, black went g4 here. And white closes off the help from the rook. After trading off the bishop for the knight, White gets that solid bi double bishop endgame that's probably going to help a lot. And things aren't looking great for black. Because after taking there, white's now attacking here. You don't have a lot of great activity on this bishop here. And so black has to concede. White gets the pawn. And white is better in this endgame. 
So in a queenless middle game, end game situation, maybe an octopus knight's not your strongest piece, but it's still a very strong knight to have. I mean, we can see here that when the knight does take here on F2, that is actually the best move in a broad equality for black, but the knight isn't as strong as it is when you have the ability to restrict all the pieces on the back row of the board for your opponent. So in our fifth game here, we have a game between Nikolai Peterson and Hans Tikkanen, and we're jumping right into the action in the middle of the game. So this example, it goes to show exactly like the last example, how in an end game situation, a knight that is an octopus isn't really as strong as it is before. It's just a really strong outpost that can be a tool in your repertoire in these late middle game stages. So here we have Rook taking D1 here, which gains the open B file for black since the white D file is going to be taken after this Rook takes back here on D1. So after the Rook takes back, black pushes up its pawn and after some rewriting by the Knight, we're able to get this Octopus Knight for black. And you can see like, obviously it's not super restricting, but it's still a very strong outpost blocking this D file for white while black has this D file of their own. So after some, for, after some maneuvering, you always have black that can come over here to D3 if need be. And black is going on to attack these pawns, try to get a better position. And after coming here, this A pawn is falling. Black always has a strong outpost because it's gonna be really hard to get to this pawn here on E4. White comes in to C1. Black is up a point and a half, clearly better. And that's all due to the fact that at the end of the day, it has this very strong outpost that white has to spend a lot of resources to prevent for or black. So in our sixth game here, we have a game between Harmon Yonkin and Francisco Yera. And what we have here is just a Sicilian defense and an Alapin variation. And so they're fighting for the center as much as possible. A very imbalanced game as the Sicilian usually gives us. And after this trading of pieces, you have Knight takes F3 here. So what would we have here? In the middle game the opening is clearly over <laughs> white has its pawn structure completely blown up but it does have this strong square here on d6 we just have to trade off this dark squared bishop because this the c pawn is already here and we don't want to get rid of our very strong knight if we can just get it to this outpost because it has no other pawns to really fight for it so what we're trying to do as white is we're trying to exchange these dark squared bishops here and get our octopus knight for white so as the game progresses, white tries to protect its pawns with its king and develop its pieces as quick as possible. White doubles up on the H file and after some, you know, strategic play, white goes ahead and says, hey, let's trade this off. Otherwise, I'm going to break open everything, take this rook and you're going to be losing. So he's forced to trade off. He gets the check. King has to come back. And it's it's a great move because it helps reroute this knight all the way back over here on d6 so a lot of planning went ahead in this in this section where we're just trying to make our pieces better and attack and it basically when we got here he thought wow i can really just use the least amount of moves necessary to get my knight into this game so after taking and routing its knight over here to the octopus we got our mission accomplished banner rolling over the aircraft carrier things are looking good for white and we can see in the rest of this game here, white has a very sizable advantage with the engine. It's at 1.6 currently, and white is just has to improve his pieces. All he has to do to win, trades off that octopus knight, but now it has two very strong rooks. The engine agrees and is now five points ahead, trading off its most powerful piece for a very strong pass pawns that are going to make themselves into beautiful queens one day. And Black is unable to really defend itself from preventing that queen from getting in. So as, as the moves come on, white can promote. You lose the rook. You're going to get a queen anyways. White is clearly winning here and win on to win. So in our last game here, we have a game between Sopio Vatadz versus Nino Basiashvili. I butchered that so bad. <laughs> so what we have here is a game where white found a quick octopus and easily won. So we go E4 and we go into a modern defense standard line. White improving its pieces in the center. Castling, getting protected, trying to trade off these bishops. Now these bishops are traded up. It doesn't really make you think that there's a, a future octopus waiting over here on, on, on D6, right? We're, right here, there's in our middle game plans, there's no way that we're even thinking of an octopus knight. But after a few moves, 
and e6 is played here. This is looking very juicy. So how do we get there? We improve our pieces, attack this knight, so that when the pawn takes back, we have this nice outpost square just ready to get in. Very juicy, trying to get our knight here. The knight retreats, and that gives us another piece here. After bishop takes here, you just take with the pawn. It exposes the king, but with this pawn structure, it's really hard for black to get its pieces over and attack the king. So after knight goes over here to b6, trying to trade off this knight, we throw our white octopus knight into the game, really limiting all of black's peace activity. And after a couple of moves, it becomes apparent that white is clearly winning. White's wanting to trade off this, but we have the rook coming in just in the nick of time and trading off the rook, the queens come out here. The bishop takes over here on g6. If the king takes on here, you move the queen over, you're getting the rook over. Things are not looking good for this king. So after the octopus is traded, bishop comes back here. Queen comes back to defend the, their knight and we get a nice protected pass pawn by this queen. Things are looking really good for white. After rook to e8, the rook comes over here, checking the king here on g7, protecting the promotion square. So all we have to do is get the rook over. The pawn is gonna get passed and you're going to win the game as white, which is what white clearly ended up doing at the end of this game. So that's it for the first chapter of this improve your chess pattern recognition where we went over the octopus knight. What most of part one is, is going over these typical piece positions like the octopus knight. We'll go over the killer knight. We'll go over, you know, the, the killer bishops, all that stuff to help you understand where we need to get our pieces so that we can understand the strategy later on. And I just don't see a lot of videos to help us with the middle game. So I'm trying to teach myself while teaching you at the same time. Leave a comment below if you think this video helps. The next video will be the killer night that will be here and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.